10 pages I sent them, they can buy the book and read the rest. You know, when you're doing genealogy, it says that your ancestor married the girl next door, and then you want to know about that family. So you need the book to be able to, to do all that. Janet, you were just um, speaking to me before the meeting about questions you get on the internet. It's some, a house, and I forgot what the house is. Um, excuse me. The house was the Blodgett House on Blodgett. Central Street. Uh, yeah. Yeah. George Blodgett wrote yeah. the book. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, it's, um, it's a plantation. It's a plantation. Uh, yeah. um, it's right. A plantation. But the, it's his mm. granddaughter, I believe, and she's looking for a photo, if anybody has a photo. So if they do. I've seen a photo somewhere. Um, you know, you can send it through us, <coughs> and I'll make sure it gets to her. Uh, there was a request for information on Towns End. Um, there's been requests for this information on the Stickney family and the Boynton, John and William Boynton, and also the Salem Fraternity Camp. Photos or stories from the Salem Fraternity Camp. And I did answer the family ones are easy. I did answer the Stickney and the Boynton. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, one just came through this week, Bailey. He's coming on November 14th. And uh, so we, we can answer some of them. But I don't, I've heard of the Salem <coughs> Oh, well, that was um, the train. Yeah. Yeah. We used to get off the train, come on the train, and walk. Oh, really? Up the railroad yeah. Avenue. Yeah, well, it would make sense. The train's there. So yeah. Had a train. And so those are the current ones that we have. Um, but the, the specific photo was the Blodgett House, if anybody has a, um, a photo from there. And then did y'all read the newsletter, on the, uh, Janet's article? Janet wrote that article about the, the WPA. Yeah. Um, so we want to thank Janet. Uh, no one has added an article to the newsletter since Jack Farrell stopped giving me the articles. That was a long time ago. Um, and um, then uh, something we're going to do, not necessarily next because it's Christmas and it doesn't seem to lend itself to Christmas, but did you read the article in the Sears Houses? Um, the Sears Built Houses, there was a short article in there about that. And uh, it was just in the Globe, and, and the Globe writer referenced the IKEA cabinet building. And he said, if you can't build a cabinet, how can you picture building a house? Well, as many of you know, the apartment is empty up upstairs in this house. And so while it was empty, we decided to upgrade a little bit. And so we did not go to Ikea, because it's on the other side of the world, as far as I'm concerned. But we did go to the um, Home Depot. Well, apparently, they read the same book. All we were building was a cabinet for the bathroom. It was just... <laughs> <laughs> and all they could think of was the article that the man wrote from the Globe that said it's just you know, an IKEA building site but with uh, 300,000 pieces. <laughs> so we're going to see if we can follow up on that. I'm hoping people will write to me or call me and give me information on perhaps other um, uh, Sears houses that there are in town. It was just a short article just to pique everyone's interest. Janet also tells us there's a Sears house look-alike in town. So we'd love to uh, talk about that story. Um, and now I drive by and I'm like, well, that, that's a Sears house. <laughs> so I'm going to see if we can do more research and um, something to look forward to probably in the spring. So now our mission is to find that guy that wrote the article about Sears houses and see if he'll come and speak. Because <laughs> you know, he did write an article for The Globe, and I do have that article. Whether they come or not, I don't. So we want to get to our speaker, but I do have just a short um, business meeting to, to get through um, because this is one of, you know, the annual meeting. We have uh, part of the annual meeting is the nominating committee, and so that's a big part of why we have to meet in September. And so we had our meeting on September 12th, and we had our uh, slots filled, <coughs> and I did a little happy dance. Everyone who was currently on uh, agreed to stay on. And I, I did a little happy dance. And so that was uh, one week. The next week, I opened my computer in the morning, and I received a resignation from someone. And um, an hour later, someone walked into the office and resigned. So now we had two openings. <laughs> I said, evidently, that little happy dance was a little premature. Um, so the people that have resigned is Diane McMahon. Diane says she's been on the board for 28 years. Diane was one of the primary movers of building this barn, uh, being the fundraising committee building this barn. And uh, she has some medical problems and family issues, and everyone finds it more and more difficult to come to meetings at night, and she mm -hmm. felt it was the time to 
um, resigned. So we hate losing Diane. We wish her well, but you have to respect, <laughs> you can't, you know, not let her resign. So um, we had to accept her resignation. And uh, then, it, uh, as I say, an hour later, in walks Amber Hobby, who has talked about resigning for a long time. It's becoming more and more difficult for her to come out at night. But Amber had a whole different swing on the whole thing. She said, quote, I talked to Susie Elwell, and she's ready to go come on the board. So I resigned. <laughs> now, I've never had anyone else who felt obliged to fill her own slot before they resigned. <laughs> It's a really good system. <laughs> it's a really good system. So, um, so this is what we're proposing. The offices, as they have been uh, before, President, myself, Susan G. Hazen. Did I introduce myself? Oh, everyone knows me. Uh, Vice President, Robert Mary, Treasurer, Sam Samuel Strife, Assistant Treasurer, Elizabeth Hicken, uh, at this point, we don't have a recording secretary. I take the notes for the meetings and do the minutes. And corresponding secretary, um, Joan Lyons. On the board of directors, there are nine directors. Each run three-year terms, and so there were three of them coming up like, this year. And so all three said they would be willing to be reappointed. Jane Boyer, Shirley Todd, and Janet Peabody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The resignations I received were from Diane McMahon and Amber Hubby, both of which would have re, um, their term would have ended in 2018. So that left us with two one-year unexpired terms. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I would put into no oh let me t I'd put into nomination Sue Elwell, who you all know from 12 Bennett Hill, and then Janet Peabody has graciously she's been the greatest member ever. <laughs> um, she runs a genealogy club club. Um, on Monday nights. Is it every Monday night? Once a month. Once a month. And I work on Monday nights, so I never get to go. But it sounds really good. And she was evidently speaking amongst the members. Now, these are people who are interested in genealogy. And uh, she found a relevant member who has been on the Newbury Historical Society, or we don't know, I keep getting the First name. Settlers of Old Settlers Newbury. Settlers of Old Newbury. And she's just left the board, served her turn, left the board, and she said, I'd be willing to go on. So, <laughs> so uh, she has become a member, as I said, she would have to be a member first, and so I'm putting into uh, nomination Sue Elwell of 12, Bennett Hill, and Stephanie Cobb of 98 Wethersfield Street um, to cover these two one-year unexpired terms. Uh, we have uh, any nominations from the floor? Can I have a vote to accept that slate as written? Uh, a motion? So moved. And seconded? Second was Shirley? Yes. Really good at these. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Because you're opposed, you're going on the board. <laughs> uh, all right. So welcome. Sue, Sue Elwell's at the back of the uh, room. Stephanie could not make it. Um, you'll love it, Sue. It's fun. <laughs> it is fun. It's, it's fascinating. <laughs> anyway, maybe not it's fun, but it's, it is fascinating. So we welcome you on board. We um, will miss both Diane and Amber. Um, but it, it's good to have uh, changes as well, so that works out as well. Take one and hand it out and pass them on. <clears throat> got to check it. <laughs> That's good. I told them you had it. Um, all right, so you're not going to let no good <clears throat> words to say about that? No, it's right? a, things were more or less the same as last year. Good, sir. Uh, good. Kind of surprising. Good. The utilities and so on, they were virtually exactly the same. So basically, there's no big change. We did a couple of projects mm -hmm. this year. Did you notice we transferred did. some money from the, yeah. uh, the funds <coughs> in Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we did a couple of projects. Yeah. My mind is just like wandering off into what were those two projects we got talked about? Oh, the trees. We got one. Oh, I know what it was. The trees in the, in the roof. <laughs> the trees trimmed with that. This roof was. Missing some shingles, uh, I 
guess partly old age and partly tree bothering them, so we got that fixed in, plus the um, boards on the top were replaced. There was some damage to and, this roof over the window. Yeah. Yeah. And we planted a new tree back there yeah. in memory of uh, Jeff. <coughs> and then we had tree work done from the back, which has been we talked about for a long time. We still have on the drawing board, they have some painting done. Um, no, pretty close to October. I don't know if it's going to happen this year, but it's still a work in progress. And uh, we're talking about doing some improvements in the house. Uh, improvements is a funny word in a historical house, but mostly in the kitchen, which is not a historical part. But um, the kitchen needs a little updating. You know, if nothing else, the stove is too big. You can't shut the door, all, open the door all the way because you hit the, you know, let's just make a couple of adjustments. So we are working on, on things all the time. As I was saying to um, Professor Russell, you work on a, an antique house, you do all kinds of work to make sure it doesn't show at all. You never want a new spot to show, you know, and, and we spend a lot of time doing that. So if we've done all our work, uh, let's move to our entertainment portion of did you know your entertainment? The entertainment portion of the evening. You read um, the article on the WPA. And um, he has all kinds of information, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm reading, you don't really care about his education, but he is a professor at uh, Northern Essex Community College in Haverhill and in Lawrence. That's both Northern Essex? Yep. yep. Um, he has a BA from St. Anselm's College, an MA from the University of Massachusetts and a Ph.D. from the University of Connecticut, so well-rounded. Uh, and I don't think you're just a WPA specialist. This is just one of many areas of expertise that you have. He goes on the road with the, the WPA. Um, I wanted to say he's going to talk about various things. I said when I wrote the article that we have a couple of projects in town hall um, that were attributed to WPA. I mean, I can't. I wasn't there in 1936. But um, Nat Millie Dummer here. This was done by Joseph Dummer. Would that be your grandfather, Nat? No, my uncle. Your uncle. His uncle. Um, and so by Joseph Dummer, he did the Registry of Deeds and Probate Records from 1640 to 1936. Oh. Now, I mean, that's, <laughs> first of all, almost 300 years. Secondly, without a computer in 1936. It's done with a typewriter, because that's what they had. And it's interesting just to read it because of the typewriting, because you don't see those errors that you used to see in typewriters anymore. And so it's all done in typewriter, and you know, sometimes you, you put down the, the shift key to get a capital and you didn't hit it long, uh, hard enough and it's floating in the air somewhere. And then some places here he has um, little side um, notes. I believe the original is at the library. Or do you have a copy as well at the library, Jim? I'm not sure. Um, there well, was I have the copy. Okay. I have the, I think, I have a copy, whether it's the original or what it is, I don't know. But it's an interesting thing. I, we use it, not all the time. Um, one of my first years in town hall, I created an index. I must have had more time in those days. I don't understand it. But now you can look up William Boynton and find out what piece of property he owned, whereas before you couldn't do that, you just had to read the whole book until you found William Boynton. But again, they didn't have street numbers, so it doesn't say, and on 12 Main Street, it starts at the Ipswich line, and it says the first parcel was Tola Tola, the second parcel was, the third parcel wasn't. You just had to read your way down the street until you find what it is you're looking for. Um, it's kind of, it's just kind of a fun thing. So I will leave that there if anyone wants to look at it. And the other thing that we have at Town Hall, again attributed to WPA, and I looked to see what kind of proof I had for that. Nothing. They told me it came from WPA. I believed them. Um, this says, these cards are from the Indian, Mexican, and Spanish wars. So they researched veterans that were um, buried in the Raleigh Cemetery with a considerable amount of information. It doesn't just say buried in the back on the right-hand side. I mean, <laughs> it says all kinds of things. And what uh, this this person's name is John Harris, uh, in the Main Street Cemetery. It says what grave number. Uh, he was a lieutenant in the Army, Raleigh Militia. 
Born in Raleigh, 425, 1772. Died in Raleigh, 10-7, 1805. A fever. Um, name and address of next of Cain, Ken. And it gives uh, Timothy and Eunice. And on the back it said, listed, discharged, and private st stone. And, and evidently, oh, it doesn't say what date. It, they wanted to have what date, but they don't have the date. It's just a blank. But they have a lot of information. Sometimes the back is all kinds of filled in. And uh, again, uh, it just strikes me how much work this would have been to look this up. No one else would have had time except for this WPA um, incentive that gave people um, incentive to do this and they were paid for this. So, having uh, stolen all your thunder, I'll introduce Dr. Stephen Russell. Yes. Inviting me and uh, this, at such a nice uh, dinner and everything was very much appreciated. It's very nice. Uh, one of the neat things about the Work Progress Administration or WPA is that it produced millions of works like what Susan just showed us, you know, all over the country. Uh, and I, I don't think we've begun to. I don't think anybody's begun to inventory them or anything like that. There's a wonderful website that tells about projects, but they really don't get to some of these smaller projects. They're more about what has been built, which I think most people know the WPA uh, by that. Maybe you've seen in the last couple of years, the Postal Service issued a series of stamps uh, on the Work Progress Administration, and uh, they you know, they're, they're basically posters, okay, which again, something that a lot of people associate the WPA with, and whereas this is historical research, what the, what the WPA also did was employ a lot of, quite a few artists, and also employed musicians. Uh, and as Susan said, uh, a lot of these projects took a lot of time. Well, you know what? In the early 19, or the after 1933, 1935, when the WPA was running, a lot of people had a lot of time. You know why? There wasn't much work. Okay. And so, of course, the WPA was a project that put people to work doing some of these things that people thought were important. Okay. You know, these, these collecting of records, uh, things that people had wanted to do for a long time but didn't have time. And now they do because they have to support themselves, and this is a way that uh, the government provided the money through which they could support themselves. So, most of you have heard of the Great Depression. I don't mean 2007, 2009, but the big, big one that began in 1929. And uh, in 1929, uh, we've had something like Oh, unemployment went from 1 million in 1928 to something like 15 million in 1929, or 1933, I'm sorry, in four years. Uh, in the automobile industry, you were employed 4.5 million in 1929, down to 1.1 1 .1 in 1932. Uh, the financial system totally collapsed. Okay. Much more than what we saw in 2007-2009. Uh, new investments uh, went from 10 billion in 1929 to 1 billion in 1932. I mean, 10 billion is not a lot by today's dollars, but by 1929 dollars, it was a lot. Uh, let's see, what else have I got here? Uh, new, uh, 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 1,300 banks closed. Uh, in 1930, 3,700 in 1931, 32. Uh, you know, just enormous wreckage to the economy. Okay. And so, I, you know, the it, it, figures I've heard is that there's probably something like, I mean, we didn't keep really good unemployment data in those days, okay? And one of the outgrowths of the Great Depression is we started to keep data on this sort of thing. But I've heard estimates of between 33 and 40 percent of the people who were working in 1929 were not working in 1932. Okay. And that, you know, 
what was the highest unemployment rate we saw in 07, 09? Probably maybe 12% in some places, and we thought that was a big deal. Okay. But this is 33 to 40%. And you had another third or so of people who had their hours reduced or their pay cut. Okay. And then the rest of the people who managed to keep working were afraid that they would be losing whatever you know, job that they had. Some of you probably you know, have heard some stories about these times, I'm sure. And uh, the people were really hurting. Uh, but the, you know, the big stock market crash happened in 1929, fall of 29. And, you know, that was bad for a lot of people. But throughout the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties as we like to call them, there were sectors of the economy that weren't doing all that well. And that particularly the rural sector, the agricultural sector. They had not benefited from the, uh, uh, you know, the, the great boom of the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties. Um, probably because they were too good at producing food and prices were down. So you didn't have quite the agricultural support system. You had some, but you didn't have uh, really, uh, it wasn't substantial enough to really boost the agricultural economy. So some people were already hurting, and then you add more to that in 1929. And the country is in a real serious, uh, serious uh, situation. Uh, <clears throat> President Hoover was elected in 1928. He takes office in March of 29. The stock market crash happens in October of 29. Uh, so this is not a good, a good term for the president. Okay? President Hoover was actually a very smart guy. He was actually a much more compassionate man I think he's given credit for. But quite frankly, neither he nor anybody else really knew what to do about all of this. The country had seen depressions before. And, you know, usually you wait it out and things get back to normal pretty soon, you know, within a year or maybe two years at the most. And the biggest one before that was 1891, 92, 93. Right. Uh, this time that wasn't happening. Okay. Uh, there just didn't seem to be any money around. Okay. Nobody had any money to spend. Prices went down. Okay, because what else are you going to do when you've got inventories to sell? Nobody's buying them. You're going to cut prices because you want to at least recoup some of your costs. You know, we, we get all excited about when prices go up. But when prices go down, that's really a lot worse. Uh, so in 1932, Franklin Roosevelt comes along and promises to do something. Okay, he talks about a new deal. And nobody really knows what that is. Mostly, he didn't really know what that meant either. I mean, because this was kind of new ground. Uh, nobody really knew how to handle a depression of this magnitude. Uh, so he takes office in March of 1933. And immediately, uh, he starts taking action in his first 100 days. He was the first president to make a big deal out of the 100 days. And since then, we've always talked about a president's first 100 days. Uh, he focused on, we like, we like to talk about the three R's, okay? Relief, recovery, and uh, restructuring, okay? Um, so what all of this resulted in was a massive increase in the role of the federal government and a role that touched people's everyday lives. Uh, so, one, there, there were, the first objective was to uh, uh, relieve people's immediate suffering. So you had some work programs uh, into these, in, even starting in the summer of 1933, and especially in the winter of 33-34, which is a pretty harsh winter, okay? So uh, you had a lot of people hurting, a lot of infrastructure damage, so the federal government pumped money into local communities to get some, to get at least people something to eat, stuff like that. Where did the money come from? Uh, they basically printed money. Okay? And they weren't so worried about inflation because deflation was the bigger problem. And Roosevelt's attitude and the attitudes of a lot of people around him, and there were some really smart people around him, was let's just do something. And it won't be perfect, but uh, we'll figure it out as we move along. All right. Uh, 
which is again they they, they knew that they were uh, you know moving pioneering new ground. By the time we get to the uh, winter, uh, spring of '34, you start to see a little bit more organization coming into the administration. Okay, again they hired a lot of people. They were very you know the new the pres president Trump's you know, his. Uh, his term looks very disorganized. But the Roosevelt administration, you didn't have quite the media spotlight on it as we do today. I mean, they were really trying everything new, hiring a lot of new people. And uh, today we would say it was chaotic. So they launched this Works Progress Administration in 1935 to get people to work on local projects. And it, they had uh, the Roosevelt administration had uh, established uh, what they called the Civil Works Administration and the Public Works Administration earlier. What this basically did was funnel money to communities to build infrastructure the way they always did, only do it faster. And here they would hire construction companies and so forth. The WPA was different in that the government actually hired people you know, through a system whereby the, the states administered it. But, uh, you didn't have this, uh, these companies as, uh, as middlemen, okay? And they focused a lot on projects that were a little bit smaller, okay? Mostly, although there were some large ones. Um, and so uh, they, uh, they also focused on projects that were a little bit peripheral to infrastructure, okay? Like the arts projects or like the records and uh, things like that. Uh, but also, a lot of them are infrastructure type projects like sewer systems, water systems, a lot of things that you might not see. Okay? Uh, I'll show you some uh, pictures and so forth, or talk about some of the projects that maybe we still see today. But there are a lot that are kind of underground, a lot of sewer systems, a lot of water systems. And, uh, so, uh, um, among the many projects, uh, there was uh, the uh, a series called the American Guidebook series, called American Guide series. You, you, this is familiar to you, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, every state had one. Okay, and it would talk about all the interesting places within a particular state. Okay, and this was an age when people were starting to take automobile trips, um, and so this was very interesting. There are interesting places that we could go to. And one of the things you got to remember about the WPA. It put people to work, but it also generated a kind of civic pride. Because what the Depression had done is really funnel the, 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 the drive out of people. You know, it made them depressed. I mean, that's what depression does. And it caused people maybe to lose that sense of community, that kind of civic pride. And you see a lot of the WPA projects you know, like the one Susan was talking about, they generate civic pride. You know, here's where our veterans are buried, or here's some of the houses that, that have been in this community, and here's the story behind them. This is something to be proud of. Okay. Uh, so the WPA did that, I think, in a way that none of the other uh, programs really, really did. And the, the other programs all had uh, very important, uh, you know, made very important contributions. As part of the WPA, there's also the uh, Federal Writers Project, where writers were hired to write uh, you know, a lot of history. Uh, they were also hired, uh, they had these uh, projects where the, uh, they interviewed some of the ex-slaves, and their immediate, there were still people who had been slaves that were still alive in the 1930s, or their children. So they would write these oral histories. They would interview them, oral histories. And again, th these are still used by historians today, you know, people doing projects and so forth. Uh, they, again, here's the historical record survey. I suspect that's what, the, um, what Susan was talking about, must have been part of that project. They wrote music. Uh, they entertained people. Uh, you know, they put on shows, you know, like go to the town bands and stuff like that. And again, great morale boosters. Uh, so, getting money spent was also a very important part of this. One, in any economic downturn, and you saw this a little bit in 2007-2009 with the uh, American Recovery and the Investment Act, the ARA, 
what you want to do is get people to spend money, okay? Because that will generate economic activity. And what the Roosevelt administration believed, and, and a lot of people believe today still, is that if you get the people at the lowest end of the economic ladder to spend money, that's going to rejuvenate the economy. Okay? Uh, not so much the people at the higher end. The people at the higher end, if you give them money, they'll, they're not going to spend it so quickly. Okay? But somebody who's uh, really hurting, as soon as they get that money, like say from uh, the money they might get from working for a week, for the WPA, they're going to right away buy something, and it's going to, they're going to buy it in their community too. So you know, it had a lot of uh, it had a lot of uh, uh, the economists have a term for it. it, it I can't remember what it is now, but it, it a little money generates a whole lot of activity. Okay, uh, you can get a lot of bang for your buck here. And again, it built confidence. So again, say you're out of work for several months, for a couple of years, you're starting to lose. Confidence in yourself, you know, even though the, the, you know the economy's messed up, it's not your fault, but you still lose confidence in yourself. And this is especially harmful for younger people, too. And younger people, if they don't have work, what happens? They might get into trouble, okay? So a lot of emphasis in these New Deal programs was uh, put on making sure that younger people had work. Um, the other part of this is, again, you, you want people to be able to keep up their skills, too. Okay, because you sort of get out of the habit of working. And so, in some ways, the New Deal helped people to manage. Everybody knew that these programs were not, were supposed to be temporary. You know, the president said, these are just temporary until the economy gets back on its feet. Okay, but he wasn't trying to implement some kind of socialism with these programs. And some of his critics thought that. But really what he says is, you know, I just try to want to get capitalism going again. Okay? And there were many other aspects to the New Deal that uh, kind of helped this along. But, uh, these plaques, you can still find these. On the one that I know is a bridge in Lowell where I've seen this plaque. Uh, and I'm sure they're in other places too. Uh, this is something that the Works Project Progress Administration built. Uh, so again, WPA uh, was part of a number of, of uh, federal programs, uh, public works, and, and sometimes people, we, we, we kind of use these uh, interchangeably, but the Public Works Administration was for private companies. Uh, the idea was to get a job to one breadwinner in a family, okay? Uh, and this helped to people to preserve and maintain skills. It, 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 they weren't necessarily going to employ everybody in the family, and that was one of the things they asked you, say, is somebody else in your family working? If they were, you know, you might be at a lower priority to be hired. Okay. But it was important that families were able to, uh, to sustain themselves. Let's see. Again, support of the arts and sciences, I talked about that. Uh, some of the other spin-off programs were uh, the National Youth Administration. This was a program that aimed to keep young people in school. So it would give uh, younger people part-time jobs, uh, you know, high school students and a few college students, or give them work during the summer. They wanted them to stay in school. Okay? They didn't want them signing up for programs that were designed for the adult breadwinners. But they wanted kids to pick, you know, to have uh, some skills, and also to be ready to join the workforce when they could. And my, many of you perhaps heard of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. Uh, this was, again, a very popular uh, New Deal program where young people went out to the countryside mostly and they built, they worked on infrastructure, they worked on things like flood control, um, maybe building uh, uh, parks and so forth. A lot of your state park systems were built by CCC. Uh, if you go up to where the Deerfield Fair is in Deerfield, New Hampshire, that was a CCC site. Until fair, and they got a little exhibit there that shows the old buildings that used to house by Oz the Fair. I think the, you know, they, they built all new buildings to, for the fair, but they built one, one exhibit there. So if you're ever there, it's very interesting. Uh, around here, there were some projects that, uh, you know, that, that were... Uh, built with the, sort of the infrastructure project. The Newburyport Stadium was a WPA project, mm. since been renovated a bit. 
uh, Landry Stadium in Amesbury, the Salisbury Town Hall, it was a WPA project. Um, and it's built to look, you know, like it was uh, uh, much older than it was, more of a colonial style. Top, Tops Field Library was a, the PWA, similar. They, they are one of the one of the interesting. If you, if you look at the list of uh, of projects in each state, what you have is a lot of farm to market roads. Okay, you know, and there were some. I think there was some in Abel. I think there was one in Amesbury. One of the problems that farmers had was that they were, they were pretty good at producing a lot, but they weren't always able to get it to the markets. And I have a story here uh, about a farmer in Newburyport. Actually, he was in Byfield in Newbury. And he uh, come into Newburyport on the, uh, sorry, but anyway, he'd come into Newburyport uh, and go from house to house and say, couldn't you please come out to the farm and buy some produce, okay, so I can have a little money you know, to pay my taxes, to buy a few things that I need. So he would, you know, try to get, you know, he, he didn't have quite the capability to bring a whole lot of stuff into the city to sell. So he'd ask people to come out to the farm, you know. And so that point, points out a problem that we have with transportation and with roadways, especially all-weather kinds of roadways. You know, sometimes they'd be okay when the weather was good, but then when the... Uh, you know, they get washed out, or during the winter, they wouldn't be able to get through. So there's a lot of projects that emphasize that. So this, you know, can, has an immediate effect. These are not your big, big, most of them aren't really big projects like building bridges, though there are a few of those. Uh, but they were projects that might have an immediate effect, putting people to work and also providing some very useful uh, service to the community. Uh, there were critics, though, no doubt about it. Okay. And it's important to look at those. Uh, first of all, they said that the New Deal, uh, putting all these people to work and being so directly involved in these projects was really inappropriate for the federal government. State governments wanted to do that, that was okay. But many people said this, this is not really what the Constitution uh, has in mind for the federal government to be doing. And President Hoover thought that too. You know, he said, and he was very critical of the New Deal. Uh, certainly during the campaign of 1932 and afterwards. And he said, you know, what we need to do is make sure that we keep those two roles separate. The federal government has the job defending the country and protecting the borders and so forth, but not involved in this sort of thing. Uh, also, uh, it was, of course, expensive. Okay. And even President Roosevelt worried about the budgetary implications of this. Okay. He said, at some point, we're going to have to be generating some tax revenue in order to pay for all of this stuff. And we can't just be printing money. He had a lot of economists around him who understood what was going on. But they, the situation was such that uh, they had to keep on moving with these programs. You couldn't start them and then say, oh, geez, we're running out of money and people are still not going back to work. Uh, some people said that these programs were ineffective okay, at restarting the economy. And once we get into 1936, you start to see that there, you know, things get better in 34, 35, 36, and then in late 36, you start to see another downturn. So the government funnels more money into these programs. But a lot of the critics said, well, how much longer can the government afford to be doing this? When maybe this is stopping the, you know, the, the regular private sector economy from moving forward. Okay, so there's a lot of concern about that. Uh, however, so many families, so many people are dependent on programs like this that it's really hard for the government to pull the plug on them. Uh, and also they're doing the interesting things in the community and they're building that civic pride. As a percentage of the unemployment, 
how how many people got help? How many people worked in these programs? Uh, you said the unemployment was close to 50%. It, it, it took a long time before the unemployment <coughs> rate to come down. Uh, these, by 1940, you do start to see you know, really good progress. But a lot of what happens at that point is the government starts to build up for defense. Okay? And so is it World War II that really ended the Depression? Some people think so. But the New Deal, what it did is it ended a lot of the suffering. Okay? It enabled people to stay in their homes, to eat, to be a little healthier. And for or a lot of ordinary people, that's really what counts. I mean, they're maybe not big, not so much worried about the big macroeconomic picture. It's what's happening in my household right. that really concerns me. And things did get better. You you know, when President Roosevelt took office, you had people wandering around all over the country looking for work, you know, and not being able to find it. Once these programs get going, at least they can stay home, and they can, you know, their kids can stay in school and you know, they can slowly rebuild their communities. And a lot of this work that they're doing, uh, really, it was useful work. One of the criticisms was that it was not, it was like leaf raking or something. Uh, or maybe that it was, they also said that the, some of the workers did not uh, work that hard. They said, uh, WPA, we poke along. Okay. You know, that was one of the one of the criticisms. But really, uh, if you look at some of the audits that the government did, and they did audit these programs, most of the time they came out okay. You know, there there really wasn't really a lot of money wasted. And of course, whenever you send out a lot of money to all over the country, there's going to be you know things that are going to go wrong. But uh, it really, you know, the record seems to be pretty good. And even the critics uh, were not all that loud. Uh, some people said, of course, that it didn't go far enough. Okay, that there should have been more programs like this, and that would have gotten the economy going a little faster. Uh, African Americans, particularly, you look at it from two ways <clears throat> from their perspective. Uh, there were always wage differentials for African Americans, uh, but for many communities, it was the only work they had. So there was good, and again, there was bad. Yeah, from, that, from their point of view, probably they would say it wasn't enough. Uh, you know, some of the work programs, most of them were segregated. Okay. Uh, one of the pictures is of a high school in South Carolina. Of course, the schools were segregated in the South, but this was a black high school. It was a beautiful building. It's a, you know, blacks never went to a school like this before. So what if it's segregated? It's a really beautiful building. And so, you know, there's another, there's a series of murals in uh, a, ho a hospital in Harlem that are just being worked on now in the last five years or so. And the New York Times had an article about about five years ago. And a lot of people, what it did is it depicted African Americans in, in sort of stereotypical fashion, you know, sort of stereotype what they wore and they were all happy and all this kind of thing. Uh, sort of like, looked like minstrels or something. And some people said, well, we really ought to take these down. They're kind of out of date. And then some people said, well, I think they've left them there and they've restored them. And they've commented on them. But they said, well, the bottom line here is that a lot of people, you never depicted African Americans in a public world before. You know? Uh, people in the thought they weren't going to they weren't going to stay here. They we really didn't want them here. But here they are on a mural in a hospital. So that means maybe we're here to stay, okay? And that we have we're part of the community. We're you know we're, that gives us permanence. You know? So I believe they've decided to keep those. Uh, and you you see that once in a while. I've, I've heard of one just <coughs> the last couple of weeks down in uh, it was in North Carolina. we again. Blacks depicted in kind of a stereotypical fashion, or showing them happy doing work in the cotton fields and that kind of thing. And <coughs> people said, well, we shouldn't have those here, but they said it's part of history. It's kind of like a lot of the discussion we have with, with the Confederate monuments now. <coughs> you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna depict that history? And uh, WPA projects, all these uh, <coughs> murals and so forth. Uh, have that uh, have, you know, have some of that the same. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, in many places, it, it didn't go far enough. Uh, for example, in Boston, throughout the 1930s, the unemployment rate didn't go below 20%. Okay, so, you know, it was tough getting the economy going. Um, let's see, I have another statistic here. 8.5 million people were employed by the WPA at one point or another, and then another 2 million through the National Youth Administration. By 1937, I, I guess your unemployment rate, instead of being 33 to 40, was probably down in the 20 range. Okay. So, you know, it's progress, but still 20% is really hot, you know, especially if you're one of those people. Uh, well, it's how many families those? Yeah, yeah, those and, and it's not, it, you can you can count it by sort of by family. Right? Yeah, we didn't. The unemployment statistics are so much more detailed and elaborate today, uh, and that's an outgrowth of, of all of this too. Uh, and, and FDR really was clear that I mean, whenever you whenever you send out a program like this to cities and states. Local politicians definitely like to get involved, and they like to take credit for it. And, and FDR understood that, and he was willing to let them do that. But he was very clear that you know there really couldn't be any corruption, no you know no patronage and no nepotism. Did it did it ever happen? Of course it did. But the record is fairly clean on all of this, as as for considering how fast all of this happened and how big the program was. Uh, as far as uh, Diversifying the workforce, again, probably it did provide some avenues of upward mobility for African Americans and for women too. You know, women in, in uh, you know, for example, single parent households, of course, could, uh, could participate. Uh, as we get into the late 30s, though, the program does begin to evolve. Uh, by 1940, you started to see the WPA working on military preparedness projects. They'd be working on airfields. Uh, the one up in Manchester, the air base in Manchester, uh, WPA did a lot of work. Finally, February 1943, the program ended, okay, with wartime employment very high. Uh, there really wasn't a need for a government program after, this after that. And the other programs pretty much went away as well, uh, including the Civilian Conservation Corps and so on. Uh, the legacy of the program, of course, is that there's still a lot of it around. Okay. Uh, you know, you see uh, remnants of these projects in a lot of different places. And there's also still this idea, okay, that the federal government really can, in times of economic stress, maybe the federal government has got a role to play. Okay. And we saw this a little bit in 2007, 2009 where people talked about these kinds of programs. They said, maybe it would be a good idea to do this sort of thing. We didn't. Uh, and a lot of people said, well, maybe that's why a lot of families haven't come out of you know, this, this big depression yet. Um, let's see. Uh, you see. You saw many of these programs sort of looked at again during uh, the Johnson era, the Great Society. Okay. Johnson actually got his political career started as being by being the statewide uh, national youth administrator in Texas, okay. and you know he saw how this could really help people, and uh, so when he be, you know under the first under the Kennedy administration and then when he became president, uh, you started to see programs that were similar to WPA and other New Deal programs being implemented. Even some of these these kinds of historical records, things that artists and so forth, and fair. <coughs> Excuse me, very small scale compared to what you see in WPA. Uh, programs like CETA, uh, Youth Conservation Corps, and so forth in the late '60s, early '70s. Uh, but in, in many ways, they they, they 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 were much much smaller. One thing, one program that does uh, survive is the Job Corps which was somewhat modeled on the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, again, it's, they train younger people to do different things today. But the point is, is you want to take young people and give them some kind of, you know, start on a career. 
And uh, the, the, the job car programs have been pretty successful, and they're you know they, they're adorable, and they're still they're still building them. Uh, again, the controversy, you know, um, it's especially today. How much of these should we preserve? Because you see a lot of murals, especially in post offices, in some of the older post offices. You could look around and you could see some of these murals, and you say, what are we going to do with them today? Uh, again, how do we depict the history as it was seen in the 1930s? You know, we have different takes on it. But I think in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm not sure this was a WPA project, but there was this depiction in their post office about Native Americans. And again, they sort of show the Native Americans welcoming the, the Europeans and all that sort of thing. And uh, people are saying, well, maybe, maybe should we take those murals down? I say, no, no, no. They're, they're some, you know, they're really a part of the town's history. Uh, maybe we can just have some commentary written on saying that this is the way history was depicted. Then. So, uh, it, but there, there's a lot as we uh, a lot of this, uh, work that uh, the artistic work has been lost to. You know, a lot of these buildings were torn down and so forth. And you know, every once in a while, uh, these things appear in you. Uh, Get a sense of what these projects were like. But, so, the, the Civic Pride piece is a really important part of it. And there were a lot of other building projects, not WPA, but uh, financed by the government, especially post offices. Okay? A lot of post offices were built in the 1930s. Did they really need all those post offices? I, you know, maybe. But they built them faster than they ordinarily would have. And in many cases, they built them much more beautifully. You know, they really are buildings that were focal points to the community. Uh, you see one in Lowell, uh, which is still used by Middlesex Community College. Uh, you know, it's got this, this kind of limestone front. And there were many like that. Uh, Manchester, New Hampshire has one that looks similar. Waterbury, Connecticut has one that looks very similar. They, you know, they, they were the same model in many communities, but they, you know, they, they, were, they were big. And they were, uh, they, sh they kind of showed that this is, this is a great community. You know, you got, here's something that you could be proud of. Uh, even in the smaller towns, the post offices were focal points. And, uh, you know, again, the federal government was, uh, was uh, patronizing those. Uh, some of the, the other public works projects were uh, the sea walls, for example, at Hampton Beach. Uh, not so much. They weren't WPA. I think they were PWA projects, you know, because the, they were protecting property. Because you know, the, a lot of stuff of work after the hurricanes of 1936, uh, all, not just uh, not just WPA projects, but also civilian conservation uh, projects, <coughs> also uh, that. So. Uh, But again, by the 1940s, it was pretty much over, and the economy was booming. No kidding. You had a labor shortage then. <laughs> okay. So an enviable position, I guess. Uh, but uh, you know, kind of lost interest in the, these kinds of uh, community pride kinds of projects. So. Any questions? Comments? No, the, the, the article, Je, Je, no, I'll get a whole sentence out. Janet did a lot of research on what had been done in, in Rowley. And uh, one of the, the things that uh, the, I think it was a 1936 town report that you were uh, quoting. And uh, it said that as soon as this became um, viable, Rowley jumped right on board to that. And that oh, was yeah. something that was really helpful to them. And um, they were able to get their own WPA chairman in town, mm -hmm. which again, they were able to bring a lot of um, projects in and get a lot of local people working. She talked about um, the, or she, you know, it talks about the sand at the um, landing on Warehouse Lane, which you know we thought was a beach. Um, for those of us old enough to remember when that was a beach, it's not a beach now. But it was really um, put there as a fire safety thing. But where were they supposed to be going? I've lost track of that. Um, 
they put in a gravel ramp so that if the fire trucks had to use the river, use the river, they use the, they, 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 could get, they could get to it. They <laughs> yeah, they had to use the river. And I, I, you know, we just think that's a beach, but really they put it there as a fire suppression. There were a lot of uh, wells dug for fire protection as WPA mm -hmm. projects. And you list, I think, four. There's four fire holes, they yeah. call them. Yeah. Um, yeah they call specifically them. that they mentioned. I believe there are more, but... Yeah. That and that's what we were hoping this crowd would bring to us, if anyone has personal knowledge about another project. Uh, and then you had another one. They worked a lot at the center school, um, and um, they put in um, indoor bathrooms? So they put in indoor bathrooms, and then in his method of frugality, the town highway supervisor took the former outhouse and turned it into a shed for the highway department. <laughs> 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 Is it reused? <laughs> <laughs> and so they were but again, you, you can see that there's millions of small-scale yeah. projects like this all over the country. I mean, they have an economic effect, but they also have a morale effect. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty neat. And you're you're just, just coming out of this depression, and guess what? Now we can use the bathroom. <laughs> you know? And it's something you said too that it's it not all bad. You know? The selectmen quoted it in the, in the town reports that there are all these projects that they wanted to get done, and this allowed them to get them done sooner yep. and less expensively yeah. for the town. During the depression, we so. wouldn't have got it done at all. Yeah. You know, because you know, up to state governments and local governments couldn't, you know, couldn't borrow and couldn't print money like the federal government would. Right. Uh, so they had to, you know, live within their means. The federal government really didn't have to do that. Now, it's one, that's one of the great innovations, I guess, <laughs> depending on your point of view, <laughs> of the New Deal, is that it brought this idea that when times are tough, it's the federal government's job not to pull back and live within their means, because tax revenues are down a lot, but to go out and spend money, okay, to get the economy going again. And, and that's what they call uh, Keynesian economics after John Maynard Keynes was a British economist. Yes. And the, always the question is, where are you going to get the money from? Well, you print it, you inflate the currency, or you borrow it, because there's still wealthy people around who can afford to buy who are interested in buying bonds. And then when the economy gets back, you'll pay it back. Okay? And that kind of worked until the 1970s, when the economy became more globalized and it's harder to control. But you saw in the 2007-9, occasionally you hear you heard that term Keynesian. And they practiced some of those when they put a lot of money in construction projects, especially in 07, 08. Again, uh, infrastructure. Yeah. And you know, construction projects are a pretty good way to get the economy going uh, because they put people to work right away. Uh, and unlike a lot of uh, things that you might buy today, you procure the materials at home. Okay, you know, the gravel and the asphalt and all that stuff. And oh, it's visible. It's visible and it, it's more all built there, you say. Yeah, it's nice. Aren't there some stone walls around town we were attributing to WPA? Um, I, yeah, and I, as now as I'm driving around, I'm wondering about a lot of others. <laughs> the one. That's one of the ones we were wondering. That is for sure. Okay, so the one on the corner of Summer and Bradford Street, where Ellen Foster lived, right there by Foster's corner. Right, right. Um, we had always heard that was a WK project, but I never found it listed. But. No, also, also on uh, yep. Cross Street and Central Street. A lot, lot of state parks. And yeah. city parks, too, yeah. uh, the, the WPA project. And the, the town report said there was a playground put in, but I don't, it never said where. We don't know where that playground I don't know where that playground was. So. <laughs> and the town report also said in some typewriter projects. Yeah. Said, but they did not elaborate. And I said, well, I think that, these that's, are the, yeah. the typewriter yeah. projects. And that's there interesting. Been that's more. what they called them. Yeah. Is that what they say? Typing. Typing, Typing projects. Typing projects. Yeah. 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 So transcribing handwritten records. So that people could yeah, preserve them. Yeah, yeah. or generating new records. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Literally, that, that, all that's really an amazing projects. project, though. I mean, it is. Do that, yeah. Again, I keep it's something that maybe the town clerk's office been wanting to do for a hundred years, but never got around to right. it. Sidewalks. Yeah, sidewalks. a lot of sidewalk lot of projects. Sidewalks. A lot of sewer and water projects in uh, Massachusetts. We have water. We still have sewer. They didn't put that in. So. Any other thoughts? Right. One of the well, one of the wells uh, talked about was right down back at her house.
Yeah, one of the water holes is the, the one behind The water you. holes, yeah. Yeah. There's always, always good fish in there, yeah. Really? <laughs> and it was so they'd be, it's like in lieu of hydrants? Right, there were no hydrants at the time. So there were a lot of fire suppression. Fire holes. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, so there, there were multiple fire yeah. holes. Yeah. What they did was they dammed the brooks, too, in different places. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, Ooh, raised, that the, raised the, the <laughs> water level so that the, the firemen had a place to pump from. Yeah. And uh, one was right there by McDonald's garage, uh, Eric's garage today. One down by School Street, one up on Independence Street. So all, all, the all, all the way up on, on each bridge. And now they won't even let you clear the debris out of the town for <laughs> yeah, I, a lot of these projects are much, much more difficult to do today because you know you got environmental regulations, safety regulations, and so forth. Which we're not, you know, mm -hmm. I happened to drive into Boston yesterday. Something I, at first I wasn't driving, I was just writing. Something I never do. And we were talking about the highways and, and how that all came under Eisenhower, and, mm -hmm. which was after my time, so those highways are always there. It's kind of a fascinating thing to read that they all started with Eisenhower. But how many of them just simply wouldn't exist now because they wouldn't go over those marshes. The, the train, which was in the middle of the 1800s, wouldn't have been able to go out over the marshes as they do now. And, and it's all... You know, such necessary stuff. Yes. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, there's good reason for it, but uh, it's, it's hard. <laughs> exactly. It's like, well, this would never be here. Yeah. Anything else we can add or ask? Or, Kathy, you look like you're going to say something, no? no? I've just been reading a book about Harry Hopkins. Yeah. And, of course, a lot of those men that went into work for Roosevelt were idealistic. They mm -hmm. really were wanted to be good. Yeah. They weren't all in it for what they could get out of it. No, no, you're absolutely That's right. No, they were, they were, they were really committed. You know, and, and President Roosevelt himself, and you know, he was a wealthy man, but he, uh, he had empathy for people who were poor. A lot of the programs too that he started had New York State had kind of done some of these things. Uh, before, he was governor of New York before, and they had sort of started some of these infrastructure kinds of things. Uh, but he uh, projected to a national level. Uh, yeah, Harry Hopkins was the uh, administrator for the uh, WPA. Uh, other people, uh, Rex for Tugwell, Harold Ikes, uh, again, involved in these projects. And, you know, they're sort of the, the, these were really smart people, too, and they, they weren't afraid to experiment, okay, because, I mean, you had almost nothing to lose. You know? uh, and that, you know, in some cases, they, they were criticized. Some of the programs didn't work out very well. Uh, or, you know, they, and then that's, you know, we, if you don't do anything, of course, you can't make any mistakes. But. Then you referred a few times to the PWA. PWA, yeah. That was uh, a little bit earlier and was focused more on bigger projects, and he funneled the money, you know, in the traditional way to construction. But it's letters. Yeah. It's letters. Public Works Administration. And then you had the Civil Works Administration, which was. Similar. But they're all federal. They're all federal, yeah. 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 And all of a sudden it was a factory. And it was still working at the time, at that time. It mm -hmm. was making, you know, leather heels. Yeah. And I can remember so well seeing a sign in the front window that said, WPA, we do our part. And you saw those signs everywhere. Yeah. In yeah. Small industries. Yeah, and they had another program, the National Recovery Association, the uh, National Recovery Act, mm -hmm. where uh, actually industries were encouraged to form associations where they would set uh, actually mini uh, minimum prices. Because you, you needed to, for companies to actually raise prices. But they also had production standards, quality standards, and you're starting to see employment standards as well. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, what uh, another piece of legislation was passed was the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, which uh, set up the framework for industries to uh, workers and industries to unionize, which resulted in wages going up. Which you know, counterintuitively, you kind of say during a depression you ought to try and cut wages, but 
what they believed is that what you want to do is raise the buying power of the ordinary worker, the ordinary person, so that they will buy stuff and then get the economy going that way. Okay? Because cutting wages is, is you know, just a race to the bottom. You know? uh, so that, again, these were new theories then. And uh, uh, you know, that, that, again, and a lot of experimentation in, in a way that I don't think we've seen since then. So what do we learn? Embark on experimentation today. I mean, it's just, it's just out of the question. In summation, what did they learn? They learned that the government, in a modern economy, the government had to be involved. Okay? And that these Keynesian uh, mechanisms did work. Okay? That when, the, the, the major lesson was that when it looked like the economy was going to start to uh, reach a, uh, a rocky point, and, and you could tell us with all of these indicators because you're collecting a lot of data by now, that was time for government to start thinking about uh, embarking on some, accelerating the pace of spending money on things that it would do anyway. Okay, we're going to build some highways, let's do it faster. Or we're going to build some you know, military bases, let's do it faster. Okay, and that but, but you need a big econ a big bureaucracy to do that, to keep track of all of this data. Okay. And you know, that that's what we wound up with in the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties. And if you look at the way the economies ran in after World War II, I mean, you know, you have just incredible prosperity. And your downturns, there are some, but they're they're minor and they don't last very long because government starts spending money very quickly. Government was spending a lot of money. And it would go into a deficit, but it would come out again. Okay. Uh, so again, you've got a very hands-on federal government. So I guess that's the lesson. Uh, now, <clears throat> you get to the 70s, and things do fall apart because the economy becomes more globalized. That's a topic for another. <laughs> well, I'll have to remember that because you do a series of uh, lectures. I like it. <laughs> well, we want to thank you very much. Well, well thank you for inviting me. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the evening. And um, I'm sure he'll answer questions if you want to speak to him. Yes. And if you want to come up and look at the, either of the books that the town clerk so graciously shared with us tonight, because <laughs> <laughs> they are going back to town hall after this. Um, but it, it, it's it's kind of interesting um, reading. Mostly, as I said, I'm kind of fascinated with the, the typing aspect of it. It hasn't been all cleaned up to make it computer, uh, computerized yet. So we thank you all for coming, and uh, make sure you bring your plates back home with you at the all, and we we'll let you drive safely. Um, hopefully you'll come to our Antiques Appraisal Night, um, October 12th, at the library. Uh, 7 o'clock, I believe, Bobby C. and Fraca. Always fun. Start thinking now what you can bring for him to appraise. And then we'll do our Christmas and the Christmas Gala the first weekend in December. So, it's all going to see you.